shrimp farmers for a while now have been using probiotics. That's not totally new. Right. Typically just adding them straight into the pond water, maybe on a schedule. It's like the standard approach. Exactly. Trying to get those good bacteria established. It was a decent idea, a good starting point. But um, the results, sometimes they felt a bit, well, hit or miss, limited. Okay. What we're seeing now, though, based on our sources, is a real shift, a kind of evolution in the thinking. Farmers are fermenting these probiotics with rice bran first. Ah, okay. So not just tossing the probiotics in, but prepping them first with rice bran. Precisely. And that seemingly small change, it unlocks a whole different level of effectiveness. It's not just about adding bacteria anymore. It's more like actively cultivating a healthier pond ecosystem. Okay, right. So l- let's unpack that. What's actually going on, you know, the, the tiny microbe level when you ferment these two things together? And what are the big wins? Why are farmers getting excited about this? Well, this fermentation, it really acts as a catalyst. It drives two major things. First, the probiotics themselves, they just multiply like crazy. Like a population explosion. Oh, yeah. A massive increase in the beneficial bacteria right there in the solution before it even hits the pond. And this big boost in good microbes, it does more than just generally improve water quality. It actively helps control harmful bacteria like uh, Vibrio. Oh, well, Vibrio is a big one, isn't it? It causes uh, some nasty diseases in shrimp. Exactly. Huge losses. So better water quality, and it helps suppress those dangerous pathogens. That's benefit number one, a really big one. Okay. A huge boost in the good guys knocking back the bad guys. Makes sense. What's the second major advantage then? The second one is all about the rice bran itself. During fermentation, the probiotics get to work breaking down that rice bran. They turn it into these incredibly small, fine, organic particles. So they're basically pre-digesting the rice bran. In a way, yes. And these tiny little particles, they become the perfect food source for zooplankton especially things like coke pods. Ah, coke pods. Those little critters shrimp love to eat. You got it. So you provide this amazing food source, the broken down rice bran, and the coke pod population just booms. You end up creating this natural, live, nutritious buffet right there in the pond. Wow. Okay. So the fermented rice bran feeds the coke pods. Which uh, multiply. And the shrimp get a feast of natural, high-quality food. That sounds like a really neat cycle. Healthier shrimp, less reliance on just artificial feed, maybe? That's exactly the idea. It creates this powerful sort of self-sustaining food web within the pond itself. Okay, now this is where it gets really interesting because, you know, we've picked up on a specific idea, maybe a misconception that's floating around out there. Oh, what's that? Some people seem to believe that the probiotics themselves directly contain coke pods. Or even that the probiotics somehow create coke pods spontaneously. Yeah. Is there any truth to that? Because, I mean, wow, that would be something else. Right. That's a really important point to clear up. And let me be absolutely direct here. No. Probiotics do not contain coke pods. They also don't magically produce them. That's Uh just, well, it's scientifically impossible. Okay. Flat out, no. Flat out, no. I mean, think about it logically. If probiotics could just whip up coke pods out of thin air. Yeah. Why would shrimp hatcheries spend so much money on things like artemia? You know those tiny brine shrimp they feed to larvae? They just dump in probiotics. Good point. And nurseries wouldn't need expensive starter kids either. Exactly. The economics just wouldn't make sense if probiotics were coat pod factories. Yeah. Plus, you know, zooplankton like coat pods. You can actually see them. They're visible to the naked eye, yeah. generally over 100 microns. Right. They're tiny, but not microscopic like bacteria. Precisely. So if someone claims to show you instant zooplankton popping up right after adding a probiotic, Well, that's either a misunderstanding of what's happening or maybe even a misrepresentation. They're completely different things biologically, bacteria and multicellular animals. Okay, that clears that up definitively. So if the probiotics aren't the source of the copepods, what do the copepods eat that makes their numbers increase so much in the system? They thrive on really fine organic particles, which, guess what? comes from decomposed stuff, like that beautifully broken down fermented rice bran we just talked about. Ah, so the probiotics role is preparing the food. Exactly. They also eat things like finely dissolved yeast particles, and yeast is often part of this fermentation process too, and some types of phytoplankton. But the key takeaway is, it's the food source, the prebiotic, like the rice bran, that fuels the coke cod boom. The probiotic is the chef preparing the meal and also improving the whole restaurant environment, the pond water. Great analogy. The chef, not Mm. the ingredients themselves. I like that. So this whole interplay, this beneficial relationship, is often called a symbiotic application. Can you define that term, 
symbiotic in this specific shrimp farming context? Sure. Symbiotic in this aquaculture sense really just means combining a probiotic that's your live beneficial microorganisms, usually from a packet with a prebiotic. Okay, and a prebiotic is? A prebiotic is basically a non-digestible food ingredient that specifically fuels the growth of those good probiotic bacteria. It's food for the probiotics. And in shrimp farming, the main prebiotic everyone's using for this, it's rice bran. Got it. Probiotic, good microbes, plus prebiotic, food for the microbes. Yeah. Symbiotic effect. You nailed it. And when you ferment them together, the probiotics go to town on that rice bran. They break down its complex structure into much smaller, more readily available organic bits. You can actually see this change, like under a microscope. Oh, absolutely. Sources mention looking before and after fermentation. You'd see the rice bran particles get noticeably smaller and way more numerous. And these tiny particles, they do double duty. Well, one, they're fantastic food for coat pods, like we said. But two, the shrimp themselves, especially the common Lidopinias vanami species, they can actually eat these small particles directly, so it acts like a feed supplement. Wow, direct feeding too. And here's another cool thing. These little particles basically get top-coated with all those extra probiotics that multiply during fermentation. So when the shrimp eat the particle, or eat the coke pod that ate the particle. They're getting a dose of probiotics along with the nutrition. Exactly. It's delivering both food and beneficial bacteria right where it's needed. It's quite elegant, really. So how do you know if you're doing it right? Like, how do you check if the process worked? The gold standard, according to the sources, is microscopic checks. You want to see two things. Definite reduction in the size of those race brand particles and a clear, significant increase in the number of probiotic bacteria in your fermented liquid. If you see both, you know you've nailed the symbiotic process. Okay, that makes sense. So let's bring this down to earth. What does this look like for a farmer, you know, actually doing this? We've got some notes here from a specific farmer, uh, Romulu in the Akavidu area. Sounds like he's had some real success. Yeah, Romulus experience provides a great practical example. His method for treating about one acre is pretty specific. He starts with 20 liters of fresh water, not pond water, fresh water. Okay. And here's a key detail. He adds salt to that fresh water until its salinity matches his pond's salinity. So if his pond is, say, three parts per thousand. He makes the fermentation water three PPT too. Why is that so important? It prevents shocking the bacteria. If you dump freshwater bacteria into salt water, they can get stressed, die off. Matching the salinity keeps them happy and active when they hit the pond. Very smart. Clever. Okay, what else goes in? All right, then comes the prebiotic. Three kilograms of raw rice bran, and crucially, it's non-oil extracted rice bran. He also sieves it carefully first to get only the fine particles. Non-de-oiled and sieved. Got it. Then, for buffering to keep the pH stable during fermentation, he adds 100 grams of sodium bicarbonate, of just regular baking soda, Okay. and then the microbes. 200 grams of dry yeast, that's live yeast powder, and 100 grams of a specific probiotic product, Nova Flock in his case. Mix it all up. Mix it all thoroughly, let it ferment for 24 hours, and then it's ready to be applied to the pond. Wow, that's a very clear recipe. Uh. And the results were on the reported. Pretty striking, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. He talked about a big improvement in water quality, said it became less thick, clearer, and that sort of slimy top layer you sometimes see, that reduced. Less gunk, basically. Pretty much. He also noticed less foam from the aerators, which often indicates a healthier water balance. And he used it as a feed supplement, too. Mentioned even fermenting it with jaggery, sometimes specifically for... Jaggery, like a type of sugar. Yeah, unrefined cane sugar. He found this improved how readily the shrimp took the feed, and that led to a better FCR feed conversion ratio, basically getting more shrimp growth for the amount of feed used. Better efficiency. That's yeah. huge for profitability. Absolutely. And maybe the most immediate thing, he said he saw visibly better shrimp color and just overall better health. Uh, within just 24 hours of applying the mix. Just one day. That's fast. It suggests the pond environment responds very quickly to this kind of treatment, a rapid shift towards better conditions. Okay, it sounds incredibly promising, almost like a silver bullet. But, you know, with any technique like this, the devil's usually in the details, right? Yeah. What are the key things, based on the sources, that listeners really need to get right to see results like Rami lose and avoid messing it up? Absolutely. There are some critical points. First off, that rice bran type, it really needs to be non-de-oiled. Why is that so crucial? 
Two reasons. One, it has a lower density, so the fine particles suspend better in the water during fermentation and in the pond. They don't just sink. Two, de-oiled bran apparently spoils much faster and just doesn't work as well for this. Okay, non-de-oiled, check. What else? Always, always sieve it. Get rid of the husks, the bigger bits. You want fine particles for efficient fermentation, and so they don't just pollute the pond bottom. Right, keep it clean. Third, water. Use fresh water to start the fermentation, not pond water, which could have unwanted stuff in it. The amount. Sources suggest somewhere between 2 and 10 liters per kilo of rice bran. More water seems to give better results, better mixing. And the salinity matching. Yes, like Romelu does. Mm -hmm. If your fresh water has low minerals, low TDS, add salt to match the pond salinity before you start fermenting. Prevents shocking the microbes later. Got it. What's next? Buffering. Add that sodium bicarbonate, the baking soda. Fermentation can make things acidic, drop the pH and alkalinity. Buffering prevents that, keeps the microbes happy. A rule of thumb mentioned is 1.6 parts per million of bicarb raises alkalinity by 1 ppm. Useful numbers. Okay, what about how long to ferment? Depends on aeration. If you can aerate the mixed bubble air through it, you can let it go longer, up to 48 hours. This gives more time for decomposition and way more probiotic multiplication. Better bang for your buck. But if you can't aerate it, then you absolutely must use it within 24 hours. If you let it sit longer without air, it goes anaerobic, starts to spoil, produces nasty stuff, you lose all the benefits and could even harm the pond. Okay, crucial difference. Aerated, up to 48 hours. No aeration, 24 hours max. Exactly. And sixth, quality control. Keep an eye and nose on it. If you see mold growing on top, toss it, produces toxins. If it develops a really foul, rotten smell, spoiled, toss it. Don't risk it. Nope. Microscopic checks are ideal. If you can do them, confirms the good stuff is happening. Seventh, the yeast. One source specifically mentions Saccharomyces boulardiae as being particularly good. Why that specific one? Well, it's a probiotic yeast itself. It helps break down tricky compounds in the rice bran called phytates, and it can apparently use rice bran as its only food source really well, making fermentation more efficient. Interesting detail. Okay, and finally putting it in the pond. Right. Don't just dump the whole fermented sludge in. The advice is to use only the milk, the liquid extract. Strain off the solids. Adding the leftover solids can just add muck to the pond bottom. You want the liquid goodies, not the leftover bran bits. Filter out the solids, use the liquid. Got it. Yeah. That's a lot of practical detail, but really crucial for success. It seems like getting these details right is the difference between mediocre results and the kind of success Romulu saw. So when you put all this together, it started as just fermenting rice bran, but it really expands into this whole system supporting the pond, doesn't it? It really does, that decomposed rice bran. It doesn't just feed coat pods. It also releases nutrients that fuel phytoplankton growth, you know, microscopic algae. Creating another natural food source. Exactly. Sources mention seeing beneficial species like Nichia and Dismus bloom in these ponds. And remember, the fermented rice bran particles, the FRB, they can actually look a bit like bioflot. Which shrimp eat directly. Right. So shrimps get food directly from the FRB, indirectly from the boosted coat pods, and indirectly from the boosted phytoplankton. Plus, all those probiotics flooding the system, they get into the shrimp's gut. Creating a healthier gut environment. Precisely. A gut dominated by good bacteria is key for digestion, nutrient absorption, and fighting off disease. The carbon in the FRB also helps manage ammonia levels in the water, keeping things stable. And wasn't there something about immunity too? Yes. The cell walls of the yeast contain beta-glucans, and the probiotic bacteria cell walls have peptidoglycan. Both are known immune stimulants. So the shrimp are getting an immune boost just by being in this environment and consuming these things. Wow. Food, better water, healthier gut, boosted immunity. And one more thing. The turbidity, the slight cloudiness from the fine FRB particles. It can actually reduce harsh sunlight penetration. This can mean less extreme plankton blooms and die-offs, fewer wild pH swings during the day. Which means less stress on the shrimp overall. Exactly. It's this whole interconnected web of benefits all stemming from that initial controlled fermentation. It's really a holistic approach. It really is. We've gone from just, you know, adding probiotics to understanding this complex symbiotic dance. Fermenting rice bran, unlocks food webs, improves water, boosts immunity, reduces stress. 
Yeah. It, it impacts pretty much everything in that pond ecosystem. It's a fantastic example of how understanding and working with natural microbial processes, rather than just adding inputs, can lead to much more profound, stable, and productive outcomes. Absolutely highlights the power of digging into the details, understanding the why behind the what. Indeed. And, you know, it really makes you think, considering how deeply these tiny microbes, these symbiotic relationships, influence the health of an entire ecosystem, like a shrimp pond, or even, you know, our own gut microbiome or the soil. What other hidden connections these powerful partnerships might we be overlooking? In all sorts of areas where we're striving for better health or more efficiency or greater well-being, it's definitely something to chew on, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Maybe something to explore in other areas you're curious about long after we wrap up here.